welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Pragya. For the first time in a century, wages fell worldwide in 2022. An ILO wage report explains how the rich got richer and the poor got poorer during the COVID-19 pandemic. But the big question is whether countries are listening. A cholera outbreak in Lebanon has the country's health system in a crisis. We bring you an update from there. And finally, the FIFA World Cup has thrown up yet another surprise. We catch up today on what to expect next at Qatar, where an Arab nation has become a first-time entrant to the quarterfinals. Real incomes, that is, incomes adjusted for inflation, fell the most in the wealthiest countries in the first six months of 2022. The International Labour Organization's Global Wage Report says incomes fell 2.2% in the wealthy G20 nations. In the emerging G20 nations, wages grew a little, but far less than before the COVID-19 pandemic. The report considers the cost of living crisis, the surge in inflation, and just how falling wages could spark social unrest in these countries. Senior business journalist Onindo Chakraborty has been tracking this debate, and we caught up with him earlier today. Hi, Onindo. Thanks for joining us. You often said that the rich are getting richer in your show. Now, the ILO has confirmed that everyone except the most wealthy has been losing money. Isn't that the message we get from the ILO report? And uh, could you talk about what else are the warnings from this report? Thank you, Pragya. Uh, You know, you're right that the ILO's report does point to increasing inequality, but it blames it on COVID like all these international institutions do, as if before that inequality was not increasing. And we've seen from the other estimates made by, for instance, the uh, WID team. And they have shown that since the 1980s, ever since finance capital has begun to rule and trickle down economics has started to uh, rule across the world, inequality has increased. Yes, there were arguments made that even though wages were kind of flat, they were still increasing compared to inflation. Inflation was low. Now inflation is very high as well. And that is a problem because even though money wages have increased, real wages, which means that if you have $100 today and you can buy X amount of things, tomorrow you need $110 because inflation has gone up by 10%. But your wages have increased by just $2. So you're about $8 away from where you were earlier. So that is what we mean by real wages. Real wages have declined on an average. I think uh, as the world, uh, this uh, ILO's report says that about 1.4 to 1.5%. And this is the first time since the ILO has been producing this report that real wages have gone down. And they're saying that if you take China out, then real wages are down more than 2%. So there's a significant increase Uh, decrease in real wages. And if you look at what is happening in African countries, what is happening in African countries since 2019-20 to 2022-23, in these three years, real wages are down nearly 12%. And now we know that when that goes down for poorer people who were already on the brink of starvation, who were just about living at subsistence level, what happens when your income, real income is down by 12%? You're now at starvation mode, literally in a situation where You can barely survive. So that is what has happened. And you were pointing that what else is this report talking about? I think one of the points that this report is making is that uh, there is a kind of propaganda going on right now that inflation has gone up because wages have gone up. Governments have spent a lot. They've given too much money to people and they're spending too much, buying too much money. Uh, too many things and therefore there's a wage increase spiral wages have gone up spiraled up and therefore profits are going down and because profits are going down what are entrepreneurs doing businesses they're doing they're passing on this wage increase to consumers this is absolutely untrue as ILO's report shows which shows that higher productivity productivity has gone up which means Profits are increasing, but wages are actually decreasing in real terms. So ILO's report actually clearly shows that whatever is being the propaganda being done, which has been done by World Bank, IMF and all kinds of economists is actually a lie. You're right. That's an important aspect. What is the possibility of change over here? There are warnings of social unrest as conditions are worsening for ordinary people. Does this report say anything about solutions? You know, because there are policy statements there, but, you know, they're very wishy-washy, namby-pamby kind of policy recommendations. The policy recommendations being made is that 
these uh, the poorest people have to be kind of given some sort of support whether it is in vouchers uh, some sort of subsidies need to continue and they've shown that because nominal wages have gone uh, real wages have gone down for about 20 percent of workers across the world so there is a chance to actually increase money wages rather than decreasing them which is what other uh, international institutions are trying to say that reduce wages cut down so that demand goes down and inflation comes down but ILO is saying, don't let that happen. Continue to maintain minimum wage uh, rules. There has to be minimum wages. Otherwise, there will be uh, a problem for the poorest of the poor, the poorest of the um, wage earners. And that is the kind of proposition that uh, ILO is making. In fact, it does say another thing, which is that temporarily indirect taxes like GST in India or sales tax in other places, which everyone pays, which is... Uh, paid equally by the richest to the poorest and they're saying that indirect taxes need to be reduced temporarily so that the 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 uh, tax weight on the poorest goes down but it does not really advocate in very loud terms that make up for it by taxing the rich more considering that the number of billionaires has increased huge profits have been made by corporates across the world in the covid years which shows that Actually, all spending by governments has actually gone into line the pockets of the richest people. It does not really say that increased taxes. It does not openly say that increased government spending, targeted welfare, just about, I would say, wishy-washy recommendations, Pragya. And thanks very much for joining us on Indo. Cholera infections and deaths are a worrying new phenomenon in Lebanon, which is in a severe economic crisis of late. The government reported 220 infections and five deaths in October when the first cases came to light after 1993. But on December 5, the Ministry of Health reported 52 suspected and confirmed cases and two deaths over just 24 hours. The cholera outbreak reportedly began among the refugees living in North Lebanon and it is said to be spreading across to other areas. Rising infections signal poor water and food quality in the camps where the refugees from strife-torn Syria are living. And the outbreak is straining Lebanon's health system severely. Uh, we spoke to Mohammed El Zayed, the health coordinator at Amel Association International, about this issue. So, so Mohammed, a, a disease which Lebanon had thought that it has eradicated is suddenly back. Can you tell us what are the reasons, how severe is the cholera outbreak? Cholera is not one of the endemic diseases in Lebanon. The last case we had in Lebanon was in 1993. Since then, we didn't have any new cases. This is particularly worrying because most of our physicians, medical and health staff have never seen or dealt with a cholera case before. It is a health collateral issue, but it's not, the reason is not health. Like we have to deal with what's happening because of other issues. The problem here in Lebanon is related to the water and sanitation situation, to the outbreak that started in Syria, and the movement between the two countries, because there is active movement between the two countries, and the water and sanitation situation in Lebanon, where many areas do not have sewage systems, they still rely on septic tanks, and specifically in informal settlements, in Syrian refugees' informal settlements. The electricity issue also exacerbates the existing uh, problem because there is no electricity to pump water and to chlorinate the water. Most of the cases where the source of contamination was identified was related to contaminated water used to uh, water uh, vegetables, okay. to, uh, for, to irrigate vegetables. And how severe is the outbreak? For now, we had some clusters, if you want some uh, uh, local outbreaks in some regions, but uh, it's not that severe. And for now, for the past at least couple of weeks, we had a plateau. The number of cases is plateauing. Thanks God, we're not having an increase in cases so far, which is good. Like till now, we're still managing. We're able to control it because it is still localized. Most of the cases fall within two cadastral areas where we can, uh, still manage the cases and equip hospitals in order to manage. Right. Can you talk about the possible solutions for the problems that cholera is facing, uh, cholera is creating for the healthcare system in, in general? 
Okay. So until now, thankfully, the system is still able to deal with the limited number of cases. In addition to the fact that we may have some severe cases where the healthcare system is not able to deal with and or not equipped to deal with. The Ministry of Public Health, supported by WHO, is working on training the healthcare staff on case management, but this is an ongoing effort and it's only in some regions in the country. In other regions where we don't have cases anymore, uh, we don't have cases yet, there are no hospitals or trained facilities that are able to deal with the cases. You know, I was reading a news report which said that the WHO has said that the vaccine should be provided, but a single dose instead of a double dose because of a lack of vaccine availability. Uh, can you just update us as to what's happening there? Okay. So globally, the ICG uh, suspended the two-dose strategy in October 2020, which is like almost the time where we had our first case in Lebanon. The first case was identified on October 6th. On October I think 20th or 22nd, the ICG suspended the two-dose strategy for the OCB and they adopted a single-dose strategy due to the global shortage in this vaccine. There are, until September this year, we had 26 countries reporting outbreaks of cholera. In any given year, usually we have less than 20. Eight of these countries, eight of these 26 countries are in the Eastern Mediterranean region. So it is an outbreak in the region and there is a demand on the vaccine and that's why the single dose strategy is being adopted. How effective it will be, there are some studies that show that single dose decreases the incidence rates among the population and therefore may be enough to stop the transmission temporarily in order to give more time to deal with the like intermediate and long-term solutions. All right, uh, Mohammed, thanks a lot for joining us. You're most welcome. A historic win for Morocco at the FIFA World Cup, which beat Spain on Tuesday, becoming the first Arab nation in the quarterfinals. The team raised the Palestinian flag after its win. But who plays whom next and what does it mean for the game? We discussed with Siddhant Ane, who is joining us from Qatar. Okay, Siddhant, thanks for joining us. Siddhant, how did Morocco do this? yesterday. Uh, some would say that, you know, when a strong team defeats another strong team, that's fine, but this is a bit of a fluke. So, what's going on? Uh, I, I would, I mean, I, forget about me, Pragya, uh, the Moroccans would argue very strongly against it being any kind of fluke. Actually, we saw the night before uh, Japan going up against uh, Croatia, also that, that match went to penalties. And there was a bit of heartbreak for, uh, you know, those of us who are neutrals and, and were in the stadium. Uh, because Japan completely fluffed their uh, penalties and, and you know were, were you know, out of the tournament after playing their hearts out, beating Spain and Germany, like we've talked about uh, a couple of times on the show as well. And then uh, they had a chance and came very close to going all the way against last time's uh, finalists at the World Cup, Croatia. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen. But the following day, uh, Morocco went ahead and did it. Uh, actually, Luis Enrique, who is the coach of the Spanish national team, was talking in the pre-match press conference. And he said that he got his players to take a thousand penalties each or he gave them the homework. So, he clearly had a plan and he stuck to it. But uh, I guess end of the day, the players couldn't execute. But for the 120 minutes that we did watch them play against each other, these two teams, it was intense. Uh, I think the Moroccans gave 100%. Uh, so, and, 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 you know, these Moroccans are playing at some of the top clubs they, they play at Bayern Munich and Paris Saint-Germain, two of the biggest clubs in, in the world. So, it's not that… Uh, it wasn't a fluke in that sense at all. Uh, they just played uh, the game of their lives and, and they've got a couple more to go if they're going to proceed further and become uh, maybe the first African tournament, uh, country, nation to make it to the semi-finals of a Men's Football World Cup. Yes, Siddhan. So, the thing is, you know, there also seems to be a bit of a nationalistic fervor here, uh, at least on the Moroccan side, more intensely. So, 14 of their players are, you know, what can you say, borrowed from European teams? They, uh, you know, what's... Uh, not really. Actually, it's, a, it's an interesting one, actually, that also brings into, uh, into light, you know, the, the whole concept yeah. of migration, uh, particularly from uh, West Asia and from North Africa into Europe. 
uh, because we find that at the one level, tens of thousands of migrants die trying to make uh, that passage over into Europe uh, to be able to have a safer, perhaps better, uh, more economically prosperous uh, life. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, 130 players at this World Cup are playing for nations other than the nation where they were born. Uh, so what, what has been happening in Morocco, and we've been talking to Moroccan journalists and, and some fans as well, uh, there has been this historical sense that players who are born outside, and this team, you're right, it, it, it has the most number of players who are born outside the nation. Well, 14 of them, I, I, and most of them born in Europe. The goalkeeper, in fact, who made those three incredible saves last night, born in Canada, and had the chance to play at the World Cup for Canada as well. Uh, but uh, so, so historically, there has been this notion that those who are born outside of Morocco don't wear the shirt with the same kind of patriotic fervor. But now that the team is doing well, now that the team is winning, uh, a lot of those things, especially in conversation with fans, you know, the, the idea of uh, nationality as such or birthplace uh, is a bit more fluid. Uh, and, and they are saying, you know, as long as the, the team does well and they are the best players, uh, in fact, the coach of this team who brought in ZH, the Chelsea player who plays on the right wing, uh, as well as a couple of uh, others, uh, he himself is born in France. So, in the okay. post-match press conference last night, this conversation, of course, came up. So, it's not a question of borrowing from other countries as much as uh, being able to use the strengths of your diaspora. And, and, I mean, in India, for example, the same argument is being made. We don't have the concept of dual nationality here, so we don't allow players uh, who, who are of Indian origin to represent us in international sporting events. But an argument is made that our team would be far stronger if we did the same. Uh, and Morocco is, is proving exactly that. So, Siddhant, the matches coming up ahead, just give us a lowdown on them. Yeah, very quickly, uh, Pragya, I guess, because we're running out of time. Uh, quarter, uh, France versus England, that, that will be uh, the game of the quarterfinals. I mean, of course, they're all big games. After you know all the color and the excitement of the of the of the group stages of the tournament, now suddenly you get to the business end and it all becomes very serious. Uh, so, so France versus England is the big one, and then of course we'll be looking at Morocco. They are playing against Portugal, a Portugal that is um, maybe going to be without Cristiano Ronaldo. So, uh, but right. scored six goals last night anyway, uh, and so the Moroccans will be out to like, like you said prove a point. And they are bringing the maximum amount of color to the tournament as of now because of the proximity and, and the closeness of the cultures. So we hope that they have a deep run into the tournament and they remain because at least for neutral fans, they are the ones who are bringing uh, the atmosphere to the stadium uh, beyond the football. Right, Siddhant, and thanks a lot for joining us. And that's a wrap for today. Thank you for watching Daily Debrief. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. You'll find more such stories on our website, peoplesdispatch.org. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram.